Hello everyone, I'm Jim Ransom and we're going to have a first look at the poetry of Wallace Stevens today. Wallace Stevens was born in 1879 and died in 1955. There's an irony there which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, I think he was one of America's best poets. He was a native of Pennsylvania educated at Harvard in its greatest years, I would say, became a lawyer at his father's insistence. His father could scarcely countenance the idea of a poet in the family, and besides that, you couldn't make a living at it, according to Dad. So Stevens worked most of his life for one of the big insurance companies in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, during which he wrote most of his poems he eventually uh, actually became uh, vice president of that company. Unlike so many modern poets, he was never uh, an academic. <clears throat> His uh, uh, first book of poems wasn't published until he was 45 years old. Um, he um, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1955 the same year his collected poems were published, and sadly, the same year that he died. A number of his poems make use of uh, music, the music of poetry, which he was very sensitive to. And this poem, which we're reading today, is called Peter Quince at the Clavier, and it's no exception. It was put to music later by Dominic Argento. I have not heard that setting, and it's on my bucket list. After I read the poem, um, I was very, very interested in it, and I thought I would read it to you today. Um, and then we'll look a little bit at the story it tells, which comes from the biblical book of Daniel. Incidentally, uh, I'm reading this to you from this uh, two-volume set that I bought many years ago. It's called uh, The Viking Book of Poetry in two volumes. And uh, <clears throat> it really is a wonderful book if you want to get a taste of many, many different poets. Okay, I'm going to turn off our background music, and um, I'm going to read you Peter Quince at the Clavier. <clears throat> Just as my fingers on these keys make music, so the self-same sounds on my spirit make a music too. Music is feeling then, not sound, and thus it is that what I feel here in this room, desiring you, thinking of your blue-shadowed silk is music. It is like the strain waked in the elders by Susanna. Of a green evening, clear and warm, she bathed in her still garden, while the red-eyed elders watching felt the bases of their being throb in witching chords and their thin blood pulse pizzicati of Hosanna. Section 2. In the green evening, clear and warm, Susanna lay. She searched the touch of springs and found concealed imaginings. She sighed for so much melody. Upon the bank she stood in the cool of spent emotions. Upon the bank... She felt among the leaves the dew of old devotions. She walked upon the grass, still quavering. The winds were like her maids, on timid feet, fetching her woven scars, yet wavering. A breath upon her hand muted the night. She turned. A cymbal clashed, and roaring horns, soon with a noise like tambourines, 
came her attendant Byzantines. They wondered why Susanna cried against the elders by her side, and as they whispered, the refrain was like a willow swept by rain. Anon, their lamps uplifted flame revealed Susanna and her shame, and then the simpering Byzantines fled with a noise like tambourines. Mo uh, beauty is momentary in the mind, the fitful tracing of a portal, but in the flesh it is immortal. The body dies, the body's beauty lives, so evenings die in their green going, a wave interminably flowing. So gardens die, their meek breath scenting the cowl of winter, done repenting. So maidens die to the auroral celebration of a maiden's choral. Susanna's music touched the body strings of those white elders, but escaping left only death's ironic scraping. Now in its immortality it plays on the clear vial of her memory and makes a constant sacrament of praise. What a beautiful poem. First off, let's ask the question, who is Peter Quince? Peter Quince, as many of you will know, is a character in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night. <laughs> Midsummer Night's Dream, who directs the play within a play in that comedy. He is a rustic, so-called, so in the context of the poem there is a tension between his role in, sh in, uh, in the story uh, <clears throat> and uh, his role here. <clears throat> the story of Susanna is an apocryphal addition to the book of Daniel. In that story, the elders are men who tried to seduce Susanna after spying on her while she was bathing. They accuse her of adultery, but she is saved by Daniel uh, who quizzes the elders and reveals that their stories don't jibe. It turns out they are executed instead of Susanna. Poetic justice. And consider this, the sections of the poem are really musical movements, each with its own distinctive rhythm. I hope you caught that. Instruments are mentioned a cymbal clashed and roaring horns. That was just before the Byzantines showed up on stage. In the last movement, body strings are mentioned as well as the clear vial of her memory. And by vial, they mean viola or violin. I think the composer had an easy time selecting his instruments for the musical setting for this poem. Well, <clears throat> we're going to move on to another poem which is quite different. <clears throat> and it comes from this book here. I've read a poem or two out of this book before. It's called Stage Whispers, poetry by Roy J. Beckmeyer. <clears throat> and that rather pedestrian name uh, hides a poet who has a lot of brains and a lot of heart. Here's a short poem which I think is just uh, great, very well constructed, and uh, actually it's on a little um, page called Poetry for Your Pocket. Um, and the, the title of it is God Rode By on his bicycle today, it was painted red, a rich shade, redolent of Baroque oils, reminiscent of the candlelit cloth of Delatour's penitent Magdalene. Nice paint job, I called. Thanks, he yelled back. Can't stop now, maybe later. He turned, noticed the pothole in the road, swerved around it with a certain grace I could only describe as divine. 
And that's a perfect example of a well-made poem. It's very concise. It says a lot in uh, a very little space. And uh, <clears throat> I, it's one of my favorite poems of Roy Beckmeyer's. Um, I want to mention, too, that <clears throat> it borders on being an ekphrastic poem. Now, you know we've talked a little bit about ekphrastic poetry, meaning a poem that describes a painting, or it could be a photograph. <clears throat> um, and this poem has a reference to a specific painting. Um, but you don't have to see the painting to understand the poem because the painting is used as an exhibit for the color of the bicycle. And of course, I was very curious, so I looked up, and you can look up <clears throat> online. On, you can Google um, the, the, uh, uh, the references, George de la Tour's Penitent Magdalene, which, which he spells out in the poem. And you will see that indeed the lap cloth of the Magdalene in that, po in that uh, picture is red. And I will say that it is a very arresting uh, painting. Very arresting indeed. <clears throat> Finally, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote in 2019 after a very moving visit to the Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C., which I'm sure many of you, or some of you at least, have seen. And I went there for a very specific reason, which was to find the name of my old high school friend, Glenn Morrison, which I found. And then <clears throat> I wrote this poem. Gleaming in the skittish sun, the ground sunk monument is one with our only world and all that's in it. We sat near each other in three schools growing up. He an athlete and smart, I smart enough but <laughs> not so game. Worked together washing dishes at a Girl Scout camp, two vacations, shared an old army tent at night, sang over the dishes, cleaned the floors, rampantly mowed the lawn, and the other parts of the grounds in the all too brief Iowa summer. That was where he saved me when I swam into deep water. Couldn't find bottom coming back. Then, off to college we parted. He to Annapolis, I to the Stanford coast. And on vacation, we talked of lovers. He flew and fought in Nam. They never found him when his plane fell into that godforsaken jungle. One day I found his name and we talked. The marble throbs with many stories and muted memories live and speak. Gleaming in the skittish sun, the ground sunk monument is one with our lonely world and all that's in it. Thank you for listening and watching. If we can survive the snow and the cold and the politicians, I hope to have you all in the audience again next week. Thanks and many blessings. Goodbye. <laughs>